Welcome to Making It in the Toy Industry, a podcast for inventors, entrepreneurs, and makers like you. And now, your host, Ajel Wade. Hey, toy people, Ajel Wade here, and welcome back to another episode of Making It in the Toy Industry. This is a weekly podcast brought to you by thetoycoach.com. Today's guest is Richard North. With zero qualifications, Richard's hunger to succeed was driven by family circumstances and a need to provide for his handicapped brother. After leaving school at 19, Richard began his entrepreneurial journey that saw him founding and exiting several companies and winning multiple business awards. An appearance on Channel 4's Secret Millionaire TV show followed as he launched Wow Stuff and became a toypreneur. So today, we're going to just dive into Richard's journey. Richard, welcome to the show. Hello, Snell, and how are you? I'm doing fantastic. It's perfect that we actually got to meet again in person like a week or two before recording this. To kick things off, I'd love you to finish this sentence for me. The thing that surprised me most about the toy industry was... That I hadn't realized how huge it is. And if I cast my mind back... When we first entered it, I hadn't realized how aggressive it could be. And I found that out within the first 24 months. Oh, what a story is in there. Okay. Tell me more about that. What happened in the first 24 months? I suppose the first part of what I said in that sentence was to do with the size of the market and how competitive it was. You know, thousands Mm -hmm. and thousands of companies competing for shelf space at retail. The second part of the sentence was if you launch a product, you know, we came into the toy industry not having come from the toy industry before. So we were a small business, probably 10 of us when we started, maybe less. None of us, apart from one, I think, had any experience in the industry. So we didn't know what to expect. And then when we launched our first toy, it got traction very quickly and it seemed to irk some other companies who, I suppose for want of a better expression, thought they owned that space in the toy aisle. That's what I'd not been expecting. I hadn't realized. But, you know, it's kind of in the past. We get on with most people. Now, you have to establish yourself over a long period of time and get to know everybody and get them to understand that you're not going to give up and go away. For us, we're in it forever. We're driven by creating those wow moments. I'm sure we'll talk more about that later, but we're very much as a team driven by the wow moments that kids and older kids, adults get when they play or see or interact with our toys rather than the money. And I suppose you could, you could say that's probably a good thing in the toy industry because it's hard to make money. But yeah, we, we're driven by the toys themselves, by creating stuff that makes those kids go wow. You triggered something in me because when I first started the toy coach and my podcast, I experienced the same thing. I felt like people were like, who is this person trying to come in and teach people? That's what we do. And maybe you kind of answered it a little bit. You kind of established that you're not going anywhere and you're not meaning to, you know, take anything from anybody, but you're just here doing your thing. But how did you not just crawl into a hole and hide? (laughs) Because that's, yeah. that's how I would, I felt and sometimes still feel when I feel like I'm rubbing people the wrong way. So how do you not feel yeah. that? <laughs> well, I mean, it's going to come down to you as an individual if, it, if it's you doing what you do so well as yeah. So it's, it's, you're looking to only yourself to protect yourself. I think as a team, a problem shared is a problem halved. And I've always had businesses, you know, this is the the longest serving and this is my forever business now. I'm not going to do anything else uh, after toys. I want to stay in the industry. I want to stay with WOW and I want to stay doing what I do. But when I entered my first industry, so as an entrepreneur with my own company, I'd had my five or six years grounding working with a publicly listed company for six years and had some wonderful training and wonderful mentors. And that was, that was walking into a business that was well established. So I haven't got this experience of being a newcomer to an industry. Mm-hmm. So when I set up my first company, I had the same experience. At first, people want to help you. They're very supportive. Yeah. You find that actually that's the majority of people. So that's the 80, 90%. That's great. And then you yeah. get the 10%. 
20% who feel you're in their territory. Yes. And because the companies I've had before have come from kind of nowhere, gone into an industry, I've done it with a team. I've done it with a team and so broad shoulders mm-hmm. with these other people. And that problem halved because I share it is so true. So you get together and you say, like, you know, look, it's only a small percentage of people that are trying to harm us or put us out of business. We can rise above that. Let's just do our thing. So you're constantly supporting each other to get through. I think very brave if you're doing what you do, you know, coming into an area where there's already very established people, but there is only you. But there has been a theme in my, what I should do next of I should be doing more collaboration and hiring a team. So what you're kind of saying is supporting that. I love that statement of a problem shared is a problem problem. halved. Yeah, that's an old saying. But yeah, you've been there, whether it's with a partner, whether it's with friends, and some issue has come up. And when your first feelings are uh, maybe being scared or wondering how you're going to get through this. And as soon as you start talking to others, you can kind of almost think it out loud and that Mm. helps you solve it and other people come up with ideas or support, make you feel so much better. That teamwork, that's what I've been looking always for when I've been in business. It's a team thing. So I might be a little bit out there on, say, LinkedIn or in the toy trade magazines, you know, certainly in the older days, talking about what we're up to next. It's more of other people now as our teams got bigger. But I still do it kind of on LinkedIn. And you find support and you find the team that takes on the burden of lots of different areas within your business. You know, as an entrepreneur, you set up a business, you're largely doing most of the stuff yourself. You grow the team. You're then delegating different areas and finding actually that there are many more people who are much better at individual things than you are. Yes. Yeah, I'm still looking for them, but I believe they exist. <laughs> <laughs> I will find yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, you will. And you know, that that's the objective of any entrepreneur in building a business. It has to be, yeah. you know, looking for great people. I had a friend in the toy industry some years ago, had a business. I always remember looking at his business as he went from one person setting up to five to 10 to 15 to 20 people. And then he would go back down to 10 people. His turnover uh-huh. would seem to drop. He'd have a few issues. He'd then start after two or three years, he'd start to build back up again. And when I looked at his business, I, I remember the stark, the thing that hit me most was his, how he recruited. He didn't have a lengthy recruitment process. He didn't take his time over it. He didn't employ Mm -hmm. recruitment specialists. Mm -hmm. I remember one occasion he was telling me where he met somebody in a bar and within a week he'd hired them as a salesperson and they weren't from the industry. Yeah. And I just thought, okay, that is the root of your problems. You're not recruiting the best possible people that you know are going to be brilliant at those tasks. You're just filling gaps. You're filling holes that you see in your business, but you're not understanding the incoming employee and whether they really are right for that role. So what I've done over the years is hopefully got much better at that and building a team so that nowadays, you know, I don't spend as much time in the business. I probably do about three to four days in the business Mm -hmm. and uh, I get involved in more specific areas. And it's wonderful, you know, they lead on product development that the team does on product ideation. I, being a little bit ADHD, I look at sort of minute detail on things, on Mm -hmm. product and packaging and stuff like that, which might sound weird. I know a lot of people won't know me for that. And then the guys do the rest. And that's Mm. really how you build a probably a sustainable business that, you know, if you go on holiday, it, nothing's going to happen. It's going to be oh my dream. Story. You'll get that. Absolutely, oh you'll my get gosh. that. And I have something in common where you've been an entrepreneur since a young age. You started a little later than me. You started at nineteen. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Being an entrepreneur, yeah. First business. How old were you when you started? Oh, I was like ten. 
<laughs> I was hardcore. I need my, to my hear mom, that. I yeah. need to hear what that was at 10. My first official business, I had bought this Lisa Frank box of jewelry creation, like a jewelry making kit. And I brought it to school and I was selling jewelry to my classmates. They were so interested in this one piece that was just a plastic jump ring and they would all put it on their nose. And at first I had so many of them, I was selling it for like 10 cents. And then when I realized I had created a fad, everyone was wearing it. It was like what the cool kids did. I was like a quarter. And then I hired my friends as employees. My friends were like making deals and then I was paying them. But a, a true fact of what still to this day is something I'm fighting with my money mindset is I will pay everyone else before I pay myself. And something one of my mentors has taught me she's like you're not building your business to take care of other people you're building your business to take care of yourself and i'm like <laughs> yeah yeah there's yeah. truth in both i wonder you know because if you don't look after your team you won't have a yeah. team and uh -huh. the team can look after the business oh you know, that's very true you build yeah. a team to look after the business and so you're looking after the team and then you hope that they are inspired motivated and then we'll build you a great business so Ew. i think there's a load of truth in what in, in your mentality and stick with that I think there's some truth as well in understanding that at the end of the day, the business, if you're the main shareholder, is there for the shareholders as well. But it, I don't think one works without the other, you know. If it's mm. very shareholder driven and it's just all about the shareholders and not about the people, you haven't got a very nice company. And, you know, yeah. I want people to come to work and love what they do. Yes, and love who they work for yeah. and why they do what they do. But what did you start at 19? I wouldn't say I was an entrepreneur at 19. So when I was oh. at school, maybe when I was eight or nine, if I go back really young, my, I bumped okay. into a friend in a bar two weeks ago, a very a lifelong mm -hmm. friend. I hadn't seen him for two or three years, but will always be a friend forever. So we were kids grew, growing up. And he, out of the blue, reminded me of something I hadn't remembered from that day at eight, nine years old to now in my mid-50s. I had um, nobody had ever reminded me of it. Nobody ever mentioned it. And this friend said to me, he's now is an Italian friend, although born in the UK. And uh -huh. I said, Richard, do you remember when we were kids, you used to sell right back when you were like eight years old, nine years old. And I, I said, what do you mean, Giuseppe? I can't, what, what are you talking about? He said, don't you remember on the street, you know, I bring out, I would go to my nan's, get a load of stuff that she was going to throw away, all sorts of trinkets and different things, put it outside the house with a for sale sign, you know, say, selling it. And then mm -hmm. people, we would I'd drum up business. And then you saw me doing this. So you went to your house and you got a load of stuff and you brought it to me. And you then said to me, I want this much for this. I want this much for this. And I want this much for this. And you can have this much of, of the money that you get and then they give me wow you were employing people <laughs> yeah <laughs> you weren't just yeah. starting a business yeah. you're like i'm an employer uh, yeah I, like... yeah yeah so and then that's the yeah. first time anybody's re could have recalled that because it's probably really only me and him that knew that happened and it was lovely to be yeah. reminded of that i thought wow i, did, I hadn't uh, recalled it so probably a few things, bits and pieces happened, but nothing that I can say, yeah, I was an entrepreneur at 15. At 19, <laughs> I left school with no qualifications. I hadn't realized I was dyslexic. And in those days, it wasn't really a, something that they checked you for. So leaving school without any qualifications, but I enjoyed school and, and I got on well with the teachers. And I think they couldn't really figure me out because I wasn't a disruptive kid. I just loved socializing and talking with the teachers and with, with other you know other pupils I wasn't the kid that everybody loved or, or, or liked or anything I was quite mm -hmm. niche in my little friendship group as well but anyway I left school and the first job I walked into a manufacturing business with a friend of mine who was going there to go purchase a part for a catapult you know a slingshot I think you Americans uh -huh. might call it. Yeah. And he was into slingshots. And while we were there, I asked the lady behind the counter if they had any jobs because I was due to leave school in the next couple of months or so. And my mum had been pushing me, you need to go out and get a job. She took my details and called me a few days later and asked me a few things about my hobbies and background and different things like that. And, and this is going to sound a bit strange. I was a world champion shooter. So I was a target like, shooter. 
I shot, really? Yeah, I shot t- target shooting rifles, and and I was a world champion. And and, and she knew. Uh, maybe I'd have mentioned it the first time I was in there, but she dug a bit more and said, "I think we've got a role for you." And this company manufactured crossbows. Would you believe? They were okay. the world's biggest crossbow manufacturer, and they were based in my hometown. I knew nothing uh-huh. about crossbows. And what they wanted to do was take crossbows into the target shooting market and try and train me up to be a champion crossbow shooter, or that was the promise. Then what happened? I turned up for work. (laughs) They put me in a sales office and they left me on my own. And I had no idea what to do, yeah. And so this secretary, realizing I'd been kind of abandoned, they gave me a kind of job on the lowest possible pay. But nobody <laughs> grabbed hold of this concept, this idea to train me up or anything. And they just said, oh, this guy, what's, I don't know what he's here for, and, and just left me then. The secretary came in and she said, do you know how to use a computer? And I didn't really. You know, so she, she showed me, and I started processing orders. And then I thought to myself, maybe to make myself, I was going to say make myself more valuable, but what I would, would actually say is so that I didn't get fired, so that I could add value, so they'd think, Okay, he's adding value. Let's not get rid of him. I got on the phone and started phoning up their customers and actually doing proactive sales out. And I started wow. getting orders in and the orders were built and built. One thing led to another. I got one of the people I was selling to offered me a bigger role in a new company. That's how my career started. And then next six years, from the age of 20 to 26, I worked for a publicly listed company and mm-hmm. had fantastic mentors met some most amazing salespeople at the most at the highest level in selling as part of this big group that I worked for who and they took me under their wing a little bit and I ended up running a small company at 26 or 25 within this big group they just gave me a chance and it worked wow. and for, for two years the business went from very very small to quite substantial and then they decided to sell everything off they were good to me, to be fair, and they supported me as they fired me and made me redundant. <laughs> yeah. So that was my early career. Wow. So it was like a job turned a little entrepreneurial. You know, I always am unsure if I like kids getting into an entrepreneurial space very young and then young adults because it's great to go through these hoops of making mistakes and learning different ways to work with people and hire people and changing paths. But what I guess I don't like is when kids get stuck in one toy company, like there's a a brand I'm thinking of right now where the young girl launched this toy line that's doing pretty well. But I feel like it gets them stuck there. It's like you're stuck in one business when what helped you become the millionaire you became, right, is doing a bunch of different things, right? Uh, It's so right. Now, why did that happen, Uh, I wonder? That's an interesting observation. I, I also, my heart bleeds when I see young kids going into work and doing exactly what you just described. They might come up with something good, but they get stuck in a rut because nobody nurtures them or mentors them. And so they stay there and it's so sad and they're not developed. Oh, that breaks my heart to think about that. And I suppose then, so why did it happen with me that I was given opportunities? I suppose when I I was a sales rep to start with, when I first joined that new company and I had a great boss, a fabulous boss, and he built a sales team over the next two or three years. He mentored me personally, so I was young and naive and not trained at all. And he came from an FMCG corporate big business like Kellogg's. And so Mm -hmm. he took me through the processes and they built into their business the processes for mentoring and and training people up. So I got some really good grounding. Mm -hmm. And as we got a bigger company and different people came in, I got to a point in selling where they wanted to promote me because my, I was the top salesperson at 23. Right. They wanted wow. to promote me because they didn't want to lose me. So it was by chance, this bit. So they promoted me to sales manager. I, at the time, thought, oh, sales manager sounds great. Now, I'd got a sales manager. So I kind of knew what the role was, managing a team, and then maybe yeah. looking after one or two major accounts. But on the whole, sales management was about managing your team. Yeah, I hadn't really grasped that as much as I should have done. So when I dive in there, 
I'm now managing a team of eight salespeople whose average age is 40. I'm 23. Oh, my gosh. It didn't work out. Really? No. I mean, I, yeah. I walked into the sales meeting, my first sales meeting, and I remember one guy at the end of the table, his nickname was Shaq, David Shackleton, and he had his feet on the table, and he was making a point. Who's this 23-year-old at start going to try and uh, be the boss of, of me at 40 years old who's been there, done it all already? And uh, it was testing. It was really difficult. And I didn't like the job. I did it for 12 months, just over. Yeah. And then they let me do key accounts, so back to sales, but bigger customers, really some mm -hmm. of the bigger customers. I thoroughly enjoyed that. And at the same right. time, 24 now probably, they gave me this small company to run. So it was probably mm -hmm. actually 24 years old I got hold of this. And yeah. over the next two years, I built it. I found what I really loved. I found wow. through that opportunity, I started to buy a load of books because I've got no formal education. I bought a load of books mm -hmm. on marketing, specifically advertising, and within that, specifically why people buy things. I started to study mm -hmm. what it, what is it about a product, you know, features, benefits, the AIDA principle, all these different things, and then how they applied print advertising, which was prolific in those days, you know, how people put a product on a page and make it sell. You know, the Ogilvy mm -hmm. and Matha, famous advertising agency, read, read books by David Ogilvy and, and started yeah. buying. And I've got a, to this day, I've still got all those books. So I've got a library full of books that then move more into the psychology of why people buy stuff. And that I remember set, Paco set Underhill. Yes. Fantastic. Paco Underhill was one of the ones that was the first why we buy a book that really struck me because I think it was a line where he said, when people pick something up on the shelf, I think the likelihood of them buying it goes to up like to 80% or something just so then for me for years, I was like, yeah. how can I get someone to pick this up? What do I have to do to make them just touch it? <laughs> like, that's I love that. Happened. Yes. We did in the early days of wow stuff, using uh -huh. some of those, those principles, we had cameras installed in a, a, a retailer that no longer exists in the UK. Uh -huh. And I got friendly with the CEO. It was a company called Debenhams. They were a billion pounds okay. retail store group. Yeah, a department store group, yeah. like a Macy's. And we had cameras installed in their gifting and toy department. And we had to get through their firewall. And it was a really complex process. But the guy was convinced that what I wanted to do could be really innovative. So put these cameras dotted around. And we had video screens of our products in action and there were touch mm -hmm. screens so you could look at a product on a shelf and if you wanted to know more about it you would touch the button on the screen that related to the product it would play a 30 second sizzle a video tvc then the cameras were observing the consumer's interaction with the screen and then mm -hmm. would they pick the product up and what we learned was if they picked the product up and looked at it if they picked it up with one hand the chances of them actually purchasing it was you couldn't, you know, it could have been zero. If they held it in both hands, there was a Shut feeling up. more of a, yeah, there was a feeling more of ownership because you saw the propensity to purchase Shut went up, up by fifty percent. Yeah. If they then held it down by their side, by their waist, by their buckle piece, that was another form of ownership. I'm having this. No. This is mine. There's another step actually I missed. If they turn it over and read more uh -huh. information about it, that actually. Yeah was sometimes high risk. You would then quite often yeah. see them put the product back. It was as if yeah. they weren't convinced off the front of the box. Yeah. So we studied all of this and we had loads of the data and uh, people used to call me, what was the, 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 it was like a James Bond villain because my office at the time had screens all around <laughs> of, the, of this, this consumer so observation cool. stuff. We really made such a difference to the sales per square foot that Michael mm -hmm. Sharp, he was the CEO, he came to see me with his executive team. And we were this startup company. We were only two years old as WOW stuff. Mm -hmm. And he came up to our small offices in the Midlands, middle of the country, and spent a whole afternoon with us. And at the end of it, he said, I'd like you to run my whole gifting and toy. It's all wow. yours. You stock it. You source, you do everything. So he would outsource it, the whole thing. Well, it was wonderful and it was a privilege to have been asked, but there's no way we could have pulled that off. 
and I obviously had to turn that down. Right. Like, I knew we were miles out of our yeah. depth in going that far at that time in our business yeah. life. But yeah, so we've seen some interesting things happen, but I love the observation of why people buy stuff. Yeah, there must be a study in the works or out now of why people buy like on TikTok. I mean, I know there's data that those sites have, but an external party yeah. literally having a video of people on their phone to see how that plays. And Somebody like, what are you somewhere and feeling? will now take right? that idea and they're going to do it and then they're going to say, Thanks, Ashley. That's wonderful. Thanks for the idea. And I've now made my million. I'm mean, <laughs> selling a book about it. Oh my, all right. Maybe I'll cut <laughs> this out. I'll cut this out and then I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nobody's going to hear this piece of the, of the podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be great. Because like, you know from data why people click on things, but you don't know. And I analyze this in myself when I'm online and I'm like, why did I buy that? What pushed me? There's actually a hair bonnet for black people that is now being marketed to white people. And they're literally having videos of black people telling white people, <laughs> it's okay for you to wear a bonnet too. You can wear the bonnet. It's not just for us. And cool. I bought it. And I'm like, I got this bonnet and I'm like, this bonnet is no better quality than the bonnets I already buy. But some reason it got me that video that it got me. I don't know why. Yeah. And the yeah. psychology of it, trying to study that. You know, yeah. we've got cameras built into phones, so we can look at the people and do probably True. eye tracking, you know, oh. see if there was, you know, the, the privacy protections and stuff. But, you know, with, with people's authorization, there'll be groups that True. probably sign up to say, yeah, I'm happy for you to eye track me. And uh, so you can see where perhaps on the screen they're looking, what they do next, you know, that kind of stuff. But they've got to do it in as an unbiased or an unprejudiced situation as possible. But, you know, yeah. as people forget that the camera's there and carry on scrolling and, and then purchasing and stuff right. like that, you'd get some pretty good data. Oh my gosh. All right. We got to move on. This is a great sidebar, but I do <laughs> want to talk about your company. Why did you start WoW Stuff? What inspired you to come into the world of toys? I mean, as you alluded to at the very beginning, the reason I came into business was more because my brother was handicapped. He'd had a stroke. So this oh. was my motivator for wanting to make enough money so I could look after him because I knew that Aww. at some point in the future he wouldn't be able to look after himself my mum and dad wouldn't be able to look after him he was three years older than me as well so that was my big driver originally and then he's very sadly passed away at 28 so he was oh. a couple of years older three years older than me and that was just horrific when I reached 28 three years later a story hit me right between the eyes. It was a Christmas and he had this to toy for Christmas. He opened it up and it was a toy he wanted. It was a, an Airfix kit in, in the UK. It's a British brand. It's, it's got a lot of heritage and it's a model kit. And you, you assemble an aeroplane with glue and bits and pieces and you assemble this mm -hmm. most, most fantastic structure into a plane. So he had this and I remember looking on with absolute jealousy that he got this most fantastic plan. And I, I, I remember <laughs> dad saw this, they saw my kind of, you know, my, my sad looking face and, and downtrodden and not having something as grand, <laughs> grandiose as, as he got. So they looked at me and they said, don't worry, when you're his age, you can have one of those Airfix kits. And as a kid, so this would be, I would probably be about eight or nine, he'd be 11 or so. And I remember thinking to myself immediately when they said that, I'll never be as old as my brother because he'll always be three years older. <laughs> but the irony of it all, of course, the sad irony, the terrible irony, is that as I got older and when he passed away, when I hit the age that he passed away, that story came to mind. And I thought, oh. wow, I am now as old as my brother. But oh. that, he was my motive and, you know, mm -hmm. so that I could look after him. But then I got inspired by other entrepreneurs that I saw, that that first company I worked at, that the one where they put me in the office and left me to it, there mm -hmm. was a fabulous entrepreneur that owned that company. And mm. I remember him driving into work in his Bentley. He pulled to the side of the road and he offered me a lift. And I was this new boy working in, in the office. He knew that I worked there. He didn't know what I did, but he pulled over <laughs> and it was a, a horrific, horrible snow, slush on the ground, very cold winter's day, winter's morning. And I'd got off the bus on the way into work and I had to work, walk the final 400 yards into work through this slush. Anyway, I accepted the ride and got in. And then I looked down at his, his really plush sheepskin 
carpets and saw all this black slush off my shoes and the bottoms of my oh, trousers no. dripping onto this pure white lamb's wool carpet. And I thought, oh, my gosh. I've only worked here a few weeks and I'm going to get fired just because of that. Oh, my God. You know? But I was in awe of you know this entrepreneur that seemed to have it all and was so happy. And that was a big driver. I thought, okay, I want to touch that lifestyle. So that then kind of inspired me to want my own business in, later in life. But toys, back to your question, toys. Why did I get into toys? By luck, not by design. So I've always loved working with people who can create amazing, innovative things. So the different businesses I've been involved with, I've always built up a team that I think, yeah, you're really great at pushing boundaries and you are as well and so on. So I bumped into a couple of guys when I was on a bit of a sabbatical, I'd sold a company and I was looking for something to do because mm-hmm. I'll never, ever stop working. I love <laughs> business and, I, you know, and now it would be toys forever. But in those days, I'd sold a, a technology company, actually, and was looking for something to do and bumped into a couple of guys at a gift fair who'd created a bathroom towel, but it was a novelty bathroom towel. And they were okay. at this exhibition selling it. And I walked up to them and um, it was an unusual, it was a very basic stand. They hadn't got a penny to rub together. They were in ripped jeans and T-shirts before <laughs> that was a fashionable thing, you know, so it was because they got no money. <laughs> and they were both scientists. I got talking to them. I was gobsmacked. And they were super clever guys with PhDs. And I asked them what they were selling and they showed me this towel. And I said, how many have you sold? And they said, oh, a couple of hundred which I thought was fantastic at the show because the show Mm -hmm. wasn't really made to sell stuff like that. You know, it wasn't designed for for selling their type of product. And then I found out they hadn't sold that at the show. They'd actually sold none at the show. That was what they'd sold since they'd started their business a year ago, a year before. And so it was a disaster basically. And they were going to go, they were going to go bust. But I looked at this product and it it was a comical novelty item. So on one half of the towel, which was was white. I'm going to grab it. I don't know whether okay, people yeah, will yeah. be able to see this, but whether you're going to actually show this. I can on YouTube. Podcast. We will put it on YouTube. So one half of the towel was white. One half of the towel was brown. On the white side of the towel, it had the word face. Uh, on the brown uh-huh. side of the towel, it had the word oh. arse. And in the US, we called it the butt face towel. So it had the word butt there. Yeah, I was going to say butt. I was going to say butt. Yeah. So it's the butt face towel in America. And, and, and this is, you know, 19 years ago, 18 years ago. And then we launched this product. That's I said, edgy. I love it. It's edgy. I love it. You know, they told me to buy, you know, they were sharing a, a flat together and one and the bathroom had one towel. So they came up with this ingenious idea to so that, that was much more hygienic because they're both sharing a towel. <laughs> so that was that, that's why they came up with the idea. We ended up selling millions of them. Millions. Millions. Yeah, five million. Yeah. So we sold them in America. We sold them in Europe. We sold them around the world. There was a a film done on my co-founder, an indie film that had a cameo part from Matthew McConaughey called Made in China. And it was about my my business partners now that went off to China to set up this business and produce this towel. And then Matthew McConaughey came, comes into this film. But it, yeah, we launched it. They ended up decorating the Museum of Contemporary Art in Australia, one of the rooms there, a huge room. They decorated it from floor to ceiling in these towels. It was on a, a, a chat show. It was. It's been on wow. TV series, comedy series. It's been on all. It's so been simple. Everywhere. Yeah, simple thing. So we started doing more novelties, and after three or four years, we migrated into toys. We met a couple mm-hmm. of other toy people, real toy people. <laughs> Weirdly, scientists again, very clever guys, yeah. and yeah. Uh, we acquired their business, their small business. That was two thousand and nine, probably. And then 2010, we launch. This was, I think, our second toy. Our first toy. This is touch sensitive. I don't know whether I've got any batteries in this. Or not. He's showing. It looks like a rubber ducky on a black pedestal. Yeah. And it will be on the YouTube channel. But wait, what does he do? So he looks like. Yeah, he, do, he looks like it. He's two yellow tennis balls stuck one on top of another with two uh, dots for eyes and a dot for a okay. nose. But it's uh-huh. full of some real clever tech stuff. So. If you pat its head, it reacts. It'll bounce up and down, depending on how many times you pat its head. If you pat it five times, it'll bounce up and down five times. It'll look left and right. It'll swivel. 
on the podium oh, that you can see below it. It'll react to music and sound. So if you oh. played your favorite music, it will cock its head to one side. It will listen. It will pick up the beat. And within five seconds, it will dance perfectly in time to the beat of that music. Wow. So this that, was with five years after you. Wow. Okay. Yeah, about, about so, four, four was, five years after we set the company up. That was our second product. The first product was a robotic monkey we called Dave. Wait, what did it do? Was it on like a branch or something? It was on your shoulder. You sat it on your shoulder. Uh, it was remote okay. control. It had a little remote control handset uh -huh. with the little buttons. Uh -huh. And you press the buttons and it would react, it would giggle, it would move, it would wave its arms, it would speak. That was That's our first so cool. toy. We launched it with no market research. And we sold over 200,000 pieces in the UK. And we thought, we're not in the novelty gifts anymore. We're in the toy business. Yeah. That's, that's how we started. Was that called Wow Stuff at the time? Yes. Yeah. It was? Yeah. It was called Wow Stuff and it was selling novelty gifts. And then that monkey, that capuchin monkey, we launched it and that made us say, look, let's pivot. Look how much bigger the toy industry is than the gifts industry. You know, how yeah. difficult can that pivot be? And, you know, and I bet the toy industry is going to be really easy. Walk in the park. How, yeah. do you, how hard can it be? <laughs> how do you foster the sense of innovation within your company? Before we started recording, I mentioned one of your product developers, Jim. Yeah. And I felt like when I met him, before I knew he worked for WOW Stuff, he had like a wow presence himself, you know, with his mohawk, I think it was lighting up at the time. Yeah. So how do you foster that culture of wow, that wow stuff? Yeah. And you know, that goes back to what I think we were, we were talking about earlier about mm. hiring. It's first of all, understanding what you stand for and what you want to be. Between myself and my original two colleagues, we wanted to create products that were wow for the children, that, that the kids would really interact with them and their first reaction should be wow so that yeah. set us on a kind of a mission we wanted those toys to be things that you and i will still remember from our childhood we wanted that to be the case that wow was so strong that it imprinted indelibly in your mind what that product was what it did so that when you're in your yeah. 40s your 50s you remember it so creating those toys that maybe, you know, we're going through this now, aren't we? You know, the fastest growing part of the toy business is this sort of adult collector, and kid or as some people call it, section of the market. And, and a lot is to do with nostalgia because they remember those toys that for them, they may have been almost inanimate, may not have been robotics or sort of interactive yeah. stuff, but they certainly, for you at the time when you were a kid, made you feel, wow, I love this. This is amazing, you know. It imprinted something indelibly in your brain that you carry forward into adulthood. And that's really what we wanted. And then from there, we look for people that were like-minded. So when we met Jim after three or four years, he brought the idea of the monkey, the, of Dave. Ah. Yeah. And then the next product, this was a scientist working at a Carnegie Mellon University who created a research robot. This I'm now referring to this, the yellow keep on robot, which looks like two tennis balls stuck one on top of another. So a giant uh -huh. version of that. And he created this robot to study children with autism. We'd seen it online and we wanted to do a toy version. The people that then took that on was one of Jim's business partner, Mark, um, and one of his colleagues. So they set about recreating that as a toy. Then as we went into sort of three, four years of the business, we spot an inventor item and the inventor couldn't get it to work properly. And now we've got these clever people in our own business that loved WOW, saw this product could be a WOW. And so they developed it further. And then I started just to find, because in the early days, it was really kind of my main role was recruitment. So I just started to look for other people like that in that mold that were good. You know, so you go with the basic values. They've got to be good, honest people high integrity, a mm -hmm. bit of a sense of humor generally. It's not compulsory, mm -hmm. but it's a nice to have and something we wanted. And most of all, they've got to want to produce things that push the boundaries. And so over the mm -hmm. years, we've built that team that creates these wonderful things where they all automatically kind of know what it is we're about, and what we need yeah. to do. Do you work with outside inventors regularly? And if so, how do they connect with you? In the 15 or 16 years in toys, I think we've worked with four outside inventors ever. Yeah. 
And I think, or we all believe, and we kind of know, with these things, it's a timing thing. Yeah. As we've built the business, there will be the right time to work with inventors. That right time is coming. It's going to yeah. be in this next 12 months. We can, okay, we all, we hold on. Feel it. Now okay. we get a follow-up for inventors listening. What <laughs> is something inventors should keep in mind when inventing for WOW stuff? Is there something that you would recommend, like a mindset you would recommend them get into? Is there anything beyond just the wow that you can, guidance you can give for what to invent for and present to wow stuff? Okay. We uh, have looked at this. So over the years when we've considered inventors and then we've dabbled, but then gone back to just doing things ourselves, you know, and, yeah. and said to people, thanks, but no, thanks. We're not, we, we, we're not ready to, you know, we would let them down if, you know, if we try to open it us up to inventor relations and, and stuff like that. So that's not what we do. Mm -hmm. That said, so going forward, we're going to be, you know, certainly in the next 12 months, what would that look like? I think it will be, we're quite clear now as a business in terms of finding our own space. We know we're where, we know we want to produce where, but within that, yeah. <laughs> what categories do we really want to, you know, work in uh, uh, and play, yeah. as you know, the cliche goes. And for us, we love tech and what tech can bring. We are always wanting to find, we, we believe that small companies are where the next big thing will come from. We know that you're going to need to collaborate with those inventors that are out there combined. I think there's going to be a beautiful mix, a real magical mix going forward. If we can get our inventor relations team or get a, an inventor relations team right in this business combined working with our internal team. I think that's where the magic will, will happen. Strategically, we'll look at four or five pillars. For example, you know, Stitch, the, the real effects, Disney Stitch Puppetronic, and it wasn't a Puppetronic. We didn't call it a Puppetronic before, but, but the, the term is just stuck. <laughs> he just, has his Stitch on the screen, and it's just so cute. Love it, huh? So you've got your blinking eyes, moving ears, yeah. and sounds and touch sensors and so on. But it's a puppet with animatronics. And mm -hmm. so the term puppetronic just stuck. And then the retailers now are saying to us, what else have you got coming in that puppetronics? So we, at that point, and I've seen this with other companies, they find their space and they find something magical. And you can build out a category or a subcategory. And that's been forever yes. in the industry from day one, isn't it? From the hundreds of years ago, toys, you know, categories develop. And, and I think we found this subcategory, whether you want to call it a subcategory of youth electronics. So we would be saying to the inventors, okay, puppetronics, mixing puppets with animatronics. It's a, an area we've developed. It's, you know, we've created... We've got other stuff coming down the line. You're going to see some amazing things. You know, we've got the sort of high price points. We've got mid price points. And now we're looking at low price points. The mid price points and the high price points, it's all coming through all in 2025, 2026. Even some already now being designed for 2027. But the low price points is where the, where some also big volume. And we do big volumes with these items. But there's big volumes at the bottom end. So that would be part of a brief perhaps that's great and then there is other areas other categories that we are looking at so we've gone into collectibles and a lot of the people in our team love collectibles but we don't want to do the same as anybody else you know so yeah. we're always coming up with some very clever things internally we love working with big brands we love working with disney universal warner brothers these emerging brands that are you know perhaps built you know, through social media, we're really fascinated about working with those guys. And what we've done over the years, and that's something we don't talk about very often, but we have worked with some of the big toy companies. We've worked with Hasbro, created a toy of the year for those guys. When Brian Goldner, God bless his soul, was CEO and chairman, we were building a fantastic relationship there. And very sadly passed away. And uh, yeah, as I say, I had a toy of the year. We did some fantastic things with Mattel. Wonderful to work with. Fantastic people there. So we behind the scenes, we've done stuff, but we're now wanting to do stuff under our own guise. Our biggest challenge is always going to be the US market because we know our products work in the US market, but we don't have boots on the ground. We don't have sales marketing. Right. That, that, you know, we don't have that infrastructure over there. You know, we've yeah. got it in the UK. Yeah. <laughs> Yet. That's right. Yet. 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 
Well, I mean, off the record, we should definitely talk about the inventor relations management when you're ready, because obviously we have a huge, huge community of that to tap into. But then you're bringing up this topic of the toy industry is definitely entering a uh, era of collaboration. We've seen Hasbro collaborate with a number of companies. We've seen them like license out some of their core brands to other companies, it seems like to create co-create products. But also I feel there's all this collaboration and combination of categories. Like you did puppets and animatronics. We saw Ty did um, kind of like outdoor play plus plush with their bouncers. So I, yeah. that's where I think the next wave of innovation is going to come in, that combination of categories. I was talking to somebody this morning, a friend of mine. I'm, I'm mentoring my son and daughter in a games business, something uh-huh. kind of close uh, to your other halves. My son and daughter, Gen Z, 25 and 26 years old, very smart kids, lovely kids, and I wanted them to be to follow in dad's footsteps, be entrepreneurs, go out there and, and you know set up a business. So they've done exactly that, and they've gone into the adult party games type business because they know Gen Z, they know the kids at universities and what the games they play and all that type of stuff. And in turn, we've teamed up, or they've teamed up with the world's biggest content creator group, so a collective. So combined, oh. they've got the biggest two hundred forty million followers so as a collective so they're not as big as mr beast as individuals but as a collective they are yeah and they're called the side men and they're a most wonderful uh oh bunch yeah of guys. I saw, yes i saw this announcement it's huge yeah. yeah yeah and it's and so just launching the first two games but what i've learned talking to uh, one of the guys there this morning listening in on a conversation actually that my son and daughter were having with them and the collab thing has been going on in their world for many years. And it's a kind of a standard Mm. everyday thing. You know, they will collaborate with brands and those brands are usually emerging brands as well that are built by young entrepreneurs who get it. And they collab with other social media groups. So for example, the Mm. Sidemen hold the world's biggest annual social media content creator event this year in March, next year it's going to be in Wembley and mm-hmm. it's a football match and it's going to be crazy you'll get Mr Beast and oh, all wow. these guys they'll fly in from all over the world they're the biggest social media content creators have come in and it's the most spectacular event I'd honestly say wow. as daft as this might sound at my age it was the best event out of pop concerts and everything else I've ever been to in my life what I had the most enjoyable time, the most seeing these young people and seeing a world I kind of almost didn't know existed and how big that world wow. was. That was a year ago. Wow. And it's going to be bigger this year. It's going to be giant. But, you know, they're yeah. collaborating with each other. One plus one equaling three is their view on life, you know. So although they're very mm. successful as individuals, together they're stronger. And then As a group of seven guys, they're stronger than as individuals. And then on top of that, when they then mix with other content creator groups and do things together, they're stronger again as they're bringing in the fans that they've got with the fans that the other guys have got, and they pull them together. There's a bit of overlap, but on the whole, it's accredited. You know, it keeps increasing. And that's what fascinates me about collabs now and and where this is all going. So I totally agree with what you've just said in the build-up to that, that... Collabs are happening and it's going to happen more in our industry. Finally, we can all stop butting heads and hiding our every yeah. secret. For our closing questions, we actually have a question that was submitted by someone who I recently interviewed. It's a new thing we're doing on this podcast where we're having the interviewee leave a question for the next interviewee. So, yes, the question that you were given by our previous guest. Oh, good question. In my whole career. In your career so far, yes. Well, yeah, for you, it's a, quite a career. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, like, okay, what? okay. The most surprising was probably the most delightful thing that happened to me. What? And uh, it's nice to be able to talk about this on this podcast because the only other time I've spoken about it was on a TikTok I did a few weeks ago. And it happened okay. to me 30 plus years ago. But I was setting up my first company and I got stabbed in the back by somebody else. So I was in a 
pretty bad place, metaphorically stabbed in the back in business. Yeah. Somebody tried yeah. to stop me starting my business. Yeah. They had an inkling of what I was going to do, and they sort of put the knife in and, and bad-mouthed me to somebody, an American company. I flew oh. out to see this American company not knowing that they'd you know, given me a bad rep already. And I was in a boardroom, and there was about a dozen of these, these executives from this quite big American business. And my pitch was to try and represent their business in the UK. So I wanted to take up distribution rights for the UK market. And I did my pitch and I got the rights from them that followed shortly afterwards, which was fantastic. Mm-hmm. About three years in, my business was growing very strongly. And I called up to speak to the CEO, the chairman and CEO and founder of that business to talk to him. I spoke to him about once every six months at that point. I dealt with all of his team, but I wanted to call him. And I spoke to his secretary and she said, Richard, I've got some terrible news. Fred Cosper, his name, Fred Cosper is dying. He's going to pass away in the next few days, but he wants to speak to you. And he's not accepting any other calls from anybody but he wants to speak to you. And so first of all, I was shocked, upset, and privileged, felt very privileged he would want to speak to me. So the call was set up, and he was literally on his deathbed, and I was in tears talking to him. And then he said, Richard, I want to tell you something that I don't think you know, but when you came out to pitch to me, I'd had contact from your competitor and they badmouthed you. They said, said you're a terrible person and, and uh, you were not to be trusted. And during your pitch, I actually mentioned it to you and you carried on talking. And I mentioned it again. And probably <laughs> with your nerves, <laughs> yeah, probably with your nerves, you didn't hear what I said. And, and I said, Fred, that, that's amazing. I, di- I didn't, and I don't recall it. And I, my goodness, man, I'd have probably wanted to dig a hole and, and, and bury myself if, you, if I had have heard it. And he said, don't worry. He said, because at that time, you're about halfway through the pitch. And even before I said it, I'd already made my mind up. I wanted to back you. Oh. And I just wow. couldn't stop crying. And oh. yeah, and that was the most wonderful thing. It was from Tallahassee in Florida. And that's how my first business started. So a long-winded wow. answer to a very short but very good question, I, I hope. But it's something that's very close to me. Great everything. Wow. Now the next question is just going to ruin the vibe, but <laughs> <laughs> what to- the, the closing question. Oh. Yeah, what sure. toy or game blew your mind as a kid? Oh, so many great toys. So many great toys. I mean, the one that... Absolutely, I indulged in, as we all did at that time, with Star Wars and the toys, the, the Kenner figures. I can remember Darth Vader, orange lightsaber, the little bit, the thinner bit at the end. With, you know, I remember it bending easily, wow. and I remember that breaking off. I can picture it as if it was yesterday. Collecting them all. It's an obvious easy one, isn't it? Star Wars. But there was another toy that probably nobody mm. would remember, and this is a weird one. And it was called Thunder Rocket. Just come to me in this instant. Called Thunder Rocket. I bet you won't find it. I I reckon it was a British toy. It was a TV commercial. I was about eight years old, and it showed these kids in a park pushing down a tube on top of a tube to compress air. So you'd have this sort of almost telescopic tube, and it had a rocket on the top of the tube, a plastic rocket, and inside the head of the rocket was a parachute. As you push down the outer tube, it compressed the air, and it pushed the top of the rocket off the top and threw it skywards and according to the advert over I think over a hundred feet and then it would, and then it would come back down with a parachute and it was called Thunder Rocket. Oh, <laughs> it's the, the sizzle old jingle yeah, the, the jingle. Old jingle Thunder oh, Rocket man. and I fell in love with this product. It's coming up to Christmas. I asked my mum and dad for it. It was the toy I wanted most. Huh? Took it out in the garden as an eight year old kid and I was a skinny little thing. I didn't have the strength to push it down, oh. and the rocket would just—we wouldn't even go, to, wouldn't even go a foot off the oh, top, no. and it would just fall on the floor. The most disappointing, <laughs> heartbreaking. You know, as a kid, hey, you cry, you cry for a long time, and oh. that toy doesn't do what you hoped it would. Oh my gosh, that's yeah. so sad. Did someone get it to work for you? No, no. It, you know, 
It would have been great, wouldn't it, if I'd have said, oh, my dad then spent weeks yeah. playing with me yeah. and, and making sure he could do it. No, he couldn't get it to work. No, <laughs> I mean, he, he was rubbish. <laughs> oh, the days before was product reviews, right? Yeah, oh, and testing. And, yeah, did somebody oh, wow. forget to ask, will this work? <laughs> let alone will it work with an eight-year-old <laughs> oh wow richard thank you so much for this conversation it was emotional we had ups we had downs we had introspection we had trend predictions it was really fantastic thank you so much for your advice that you gave me and the other entrepreneurs and inventors listening to this podcast thank you thank you for being such a wonderful host and indulging me in Please. my career thank you my pleasure. Now, if you love this podcast and you haven't already left a review, what are you waiting for? Your reviews keep me and amazing guests like Richard coming back week after week. So every time a new review comes in, I get a huge smile on my face and I forward it to my husband. So please send in those reviews wherever you're listening to this podcast and leave us a review. As always, thank you so much for spending this time with me today. I know your time is super valuable and that there are a ton of podcasts out there. So it truly means the world to me that you tune into this one. Until next week, I'll see you later, toy people. Thanks for listening to the Making It in the Toy Industry podcast with Ajel Wade. Head over to thetoycoach.com for more information, tips, and advice.